Y'all just seem like you are glad to not be dying and going to hell. Amen? Amen. That's a good way to be. It's a good way to be. Um, I'm going I'm to do something a little different this morning. I like to do this around this time of year, Thanksgiving time. Um, believe it or not, they still had Thanksgiving years ago before they watched football games. I know it's hard to believe, but that's how they did it back in the old days. And um, the, the idea of Thanksgiving, I mean, the devil just likes to corrupt stuff. The idea of Thanksgiving was our pilgrim forefathers, not our government forefathers, the Puritans, <coughs> and they called themselves that or were called that because they felt like they believed a, a pure doctrine. They believed the word of God. And uh, they had separated from the Church of England, which to them was too close to the king and too close to the Vatican. So they didn't like it. So they came over to this land, and the first they landed at Plymouth Rock, and that's not where they were going to land. But they landed there in what ship? The Mayflower. And um, they settled there, and... I'm going to say a third of them to a half of them died. Never made it through that first winter. And um, so anyway, it was the aid and assistance of a Native American by the name of Squanto, who had been taken to England and taught English and was taught Christianity and taught the British ways and came back to his own people and Squanto came across these fellas with these great big hats and big belt buckles and these guns with the mushroom end on it and does anybody know what words Squanto spoke to those men in that hunting party? Anybody know? Do you have any beer? That's what he said. Okay? And of course, they were going. I mean, here we are looking at a, a, I don't know what tribe he was from. And they're expecting, we're, we're fixing to get it. So this guy not only is friendly to him, not only is he not going to kill him, he's asking them for beer. And they said, no, but we have some rum. Okay, I'll take that. And... Um, the rest, I'm, that, listen, that's true. That's a true story. And, um, but anyway, what happened was God, God had heard their prayers and he used this man to help them understand the land, where to find turkey, where to find deer, where to find this, things to eat, how to grow things out of the ground in that country and, or in this country as opposed to in England or some of them were in Holland. And, um, and, it, and God used him to save their lives. And so that first harvest time that came in, they, they were having a Thanksgiving feast, and that was a day set aside to worship God and to give Him thanks for giving them food to eat, wood to cut down, land to till. I mean, God was giving those, those men, according to their faithfulness, according to their willingness to trust in God, God was blessing them with that. So our nation establishes every year, this time of year, sets aside a national holiday. It is a day of thanksgiving. It is supposed to be for us as Americans to tell God thank you for what he's given us, what he's done for us, how he's fed us, clothed us, given us the things that we have, taken away things that we don't need or shouldn't have. We're to take that day, set it aside to thank God for that. There's nothing wrong with celebrating that with a feast because that represents God's bountiful supply to us, okay? Uh, God gives his people plenty. David said, my cup runneth over. I got plenty. And um, that's what it's supposed to be. And, of course, there was a time when there was a lot of that going on. But now it's, I mean, I see, Lisa and I went to Costco Saturday, and, of course, they were packed. I mean, everybody's getting their big bulk items of stuff that they're going to have for Thanksgiving, including I saw a woman walk out with the biggest bottle of vodka I've ever seen in my life. 
walking out of Costco and I'm going, she ought to be thankful, but I don't think she's going to be. And um, so what a shame it is. And uh, this is not, some, some have said, well, I don't do Thanksgiving because it's not in the Bible. This is where the liberty comes in. This is where the, God's freedom comes in. We're not doing this because we have to. There is no commandment that commands us that we have to set aside this day and we must pray and eat turkey or, we're gonna, or God's going to be mad at us. There's no commandment for that. It is a thanksgiving offering, freely done. In the Old Testament law, there were tithes, which were mandatory. But there were also free offerings, which were not. But they were given out of the goodness of their heart. They're given for charity's sake, for love's sake. And so um, this holiday that's coming up, take that time. Tell God thank you for what he's... If you do that first, God will give you the rest of the day. Do you know that? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So how did this thing come about? As if I'm going to do some of this Sunday school and probably do some of this this afternoon. I'm going to announce it now. We, I think our service this afternoon is 2. Okay? And um, that's because the sleepy hasn't set quite in yet. You have no idea what it's like to preach a service after a big meal like that and everybody's going. Because then I get jealous. And I want to be where you are. Isaiah 55, turn there in your Bibles. Isaiah 55. I'm going to um, say some things that's going to make you yearn either for God to change this nation or to God to do away with it and give us a better one. Okay? It's, but it's going to make you yearn on how things used to be. God said in Isaiah 55, 5, He said, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that knowest that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Now, there's many applications to this. Number one, I believe the main thrust of this passage is a prophecy of God saving the Gentiles. They, God knew his people Israel... But the Gentiles were outside of that, and God had not called them, had not blessed them. He was giving his blessings to Israel. But God knew that Israel was going to reject it when Christ came, and so he was going to turn his offer of salvation away from the Jews and over to the Gentiles. And he's going to, he does that to provoke Israel to jealousy, like Jacob did Esau. Trying to provoke him that God's going to use us Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy because they're going to see us glorified by God himself, by Jesus Christ himself, and they are without. And they're going to want it. And they're going to think, well, we've kept the law all this time. And God's going to tell them, no, you never have. You never did. But I sent my son that did. So to me, the perfect application of this is a prophecy concerning the Gentile people that God is going to call them Nations that knew not thee. Who in, everybody in this room has got a different, a little bit different ethnic background. Even though we could, I'm looking at you, we could probably all be characterized as European in some way. Um, but everybody here has got a little bit different background. Who's, who's, where's our Germans at? Raise your hand, Mom. Corzine's German. Okay. Where's our, uh, do we got any Italians? How much? Because that's we don't let Italians in here but primarily. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. You got some Italian, anybody got any Irish? Anybody got any Dutch in them? All right, there's our Dutch. Any, any Native American in them? Sterling, you have. Okay. So look at, that, look at that verse. Nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. So out of every nation, we got Kenyan upstairs, got some Europeans down here, got some just different mixed people. God is going to glorify them and they're going to come to Christ. Okay? So that to me is the primary application of that verse, the fulfillment. 
But then I see, historically, that the things that God did with Israel in the Old Testament, I can point you to history of America and say, this is God doing that, and you see a picture of it in the Bible. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? And I want you to think about this. How did, how did we, how did our pilgrim forefathers, what, what caused them to want to come to this land, knowing that maybe some of them would never live through the next winter? What would cause them to leave where they were? The Puritans, by and large, were, they were English or British citizens, but they were, they were despised by the Church of England. The Church of England didn't like them for the way they worshipped and the way they said things. Puritans didn't like the Church of England for the way they worshipped and the way they said things and some things they believed. And so there was a schism there. And it got so bad at one point that many of them had to leave England and move to Holland to escape death. Okay, under Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Roman Catholic queen over England, and she was a tyrant, militant Roman Catholic that was not going to tolerate these Puritans. And, that is, and they, so they had to leave. They had to go to Holland. Okay? But here's what God put in their heart. They left Egyptian bondage. And up there on the screen, bondage under the Church of Rome. The Vatican hated these people because they believed the Bible. They were in bondage in many ways to the Church of England. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and some of these, they did not like the Puritans. And they were going to persecute them. And then I've got Bloody Mary, Queen of Scots. That was her nickname, Bloody Mary, because she was a tyrant. She killed Puritans. She killed Bible believers in the name of the Vatican, in the name of Rome. That's what she did. So they left their land, came across the sea to a new land. Think about it. God pulled Israel out of Egyptian bondage and brought them across the sea to a land that he had promised them. Okay? And, and if you look at it that simply, this, this is what I see. Now let me show you this. Here's the first charter of Virginia. Uh, the, the land settlements in New England primarily were under the control of the British Empire. And so King James of England who is the same King James that our Bible is, um, granted a charter for people to come and settle in the land of Virginia to, uh, to be by themselves, to grow crops, maybe to have plantations so they could trade back and forth and so on. But anyway, here's what was on King James's heart when he allowed some of these people to go to the New World. He said, we great commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may, by the providence of Almighty God, hereafter tend to the glory of His divine majesty in propagating of Christian religion. King James is allowing these people to settle in Virginia because he knows that what they want to do is advance Christianity. Not the Pope's version of it, not any other version of it, Bible Christianity. And so he said, uh, he said, in propagating the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God, and may in time bring the infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and to a settled and quiet government. And what he's saying here is, we know that there are indigenous people over there, Native Americans, we call them Indians or whatever. We know they're over there, and from our experience, they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died for their sin. So we're going to allow these people to go over there and preach the gospel to them to try to win some of them to Christ. And once they have knowledge of God, they have knowledge of Christ, they have knowledge of God's Word and God's laws, then the hope was it would be possible then that instead of them being warriors constantly looking for people to kill, that God would give them in their hearts a certain civility in their governance. In other words, uh, they would be at peace then with the white man that was coming over there. But the objective was to send these Puritan believers over here so that when they encounter these Indians, try to preach the gospel to them to, to get them saved. Okay? You didn't see that in your history books. 
That didn't show up in public school history, okay? But it's a matter of American uh, fact. In 1608, a group called the Separatists, their Congregation Church Covenant, listen to this. This is how they saw themselves in 1608. They shook off this yoke of anti-Christian bondage. They're talking about the Antichrist. And as the Lord's free people joined themselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate in the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known unto them according to their best endeavors whatsoever it should cost them, the Lord assisting them. Now this is something that when these pilgrims went into Holland, they started churches there and this was their agreement. They believed that they were under the Antichrist spirit being in bondage to either the Church of Rome or the Church of England. And they said, we're going to separate ourselves out and we're going to join ourselves together as the Lord's free people. And, and think about it. God has put it in our nature to hate being in bondage. Nobody volunteers to spend 20 years in prison. Okay? If they do, they probably don't have anything else to live for. And that's, that's the last thing they got. God put it in us to want to be free. And these people, trying to worship, trying to follow the Bible in England, were not free to do so. So they left. And they went to Holland. And they joined themselves together. And they made a covenant between them and the Lord that they were going to be His people and God was going to be their God. And no matter what it cost them, this is what they were going to do. And you guys know me. You know where my heart is. I think Bible Christianity, in our minds and our hearts, should be whatsoever the cost. If we lose our fame, we lose our fortune, we lose all of our friends, we lose our family members. That was four F's, by the way. Fame, fortune, family members, and friends. Okay? If we lose all of them, and our funds, money. If we lose our land, we lose our house, we lose our cars, we lose our health, we lose everything. Would it be worth that to gain eternal life? What would you, what would you give away in this world to attain eternal life by Jesus Christ? Everything. You're supposed to be like Paul is and counting everything that you have as already gone. Counting it but lost. For the for the, uh, the cause of Jesus Christ. So this is what was in their mind before they ever left Holland, before they ever left England. This was in their mind that they were going to establish a people in covenant with God. And that when they ruled over themselves, their, their rules and their laws and guidelines were going to be based upon the Bible and not anything else. Okay? That you didn't learn. One of their leaders, a man by the name of William Brewster, said this. The church, watch what he said. The church that had been brought over the ocean now saw another church, the firstborn in America, holding the same faith in the same simplicity of self-government under Christ alone. William Brewster himself believed in the, in the symbolism of God's people in England, in Europe, being under bondage. God compelling them and setting them free and they crossed the sea and came to a new land and God was going to establish them with a government that was modeled after what's in the Bible. They were not coming over here to make their fortune. They were not coming over here uh, and bring in slave labor because that's what they believed. There were some that did that. Don't get me wrong. But as far as the governance of America and these colonies and these settlements, it was in the heart of these people to do it God's way and nobody else's way. Does that make sense to everybody? Did we have, as a beginning of this nation, did we have a Christian beginning, a Christian origin? Yes. No doubt in my mind. The answer is yes. Um, did I read all that? Yeah, the church had been brought over the ocean. Now saw another church. That's what he's thinking. He's seeing Israel coming out of Egypt, crossing the sea, going into the promised land. And God gave his people his word to govern themselves. Did he not? Think of the dates. 1608, 
is right in the heart of the translation of the King James Bible. And it wasn't until 1620, 1619, 1620, that was the beginning of what was called the Great Migration. You had thousands and thousands and thousands of Bible believers leaving Europe and coming to this land. And God, th think of it, 1620 is after 1611. Okay? God gave them his word, purified seven times, and they have it as they're establishing the first towns, the first communities, the first civil governments. As they're establishing these things in this land, they're doing it by thus saith the Lord. They're not following Buddha. They're not Muslim. They're not Jews. They're not any other religion in the world. They are Christian people. And this is what was in their, in their mind. So now, uh, William Bradford again. This is what he said. Describing their departure from Holland to America. He said, so being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation. Their pastor taking his text from Ezra 8.21. And there at, at the river by Ahaba, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek of him a right way for us and for our children and for our substance. And so he says, and the rest of the time was spent in, in pouring out prayers to the Lord with great fervency, mixed with abundance of tears. So they left the goodly and pleasant city, which had been their resting place for near 12 years, but they knew that they were pilgrims, and, he, and I put in there Hebrews 12, but lift their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirit. So what they're, what's in their mind is, they know they've got to leave Holland, they've got to get out of Europe, they're going to come to this new land, and they're going to ask God to bless that. But also in mind, as they are pilgrims coming to this new land, that even at that, they will still remain pilgrims because they have a better country to look forward to. Amen? So what, what are we going to have if we lose our country? If, if the liberals and the sodomites and the, every, that whole crowd, that marijuana smoking crowd, gets what they want in this nation... And just as now we're, we're sort of leaning to conservatism in this nation, they gain footholds again and sell a bill of goods to the American people. And so America becomes more liberal and more liberal and more liberal and more without God. We're going to lose this thing. It's going to be illegal to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ in this country because it's going to offend people. Oh, we can't have that. Amen? But that's how these people saw themselves. They saw themselves as pilgrims on a journey looking for their promised land. So here's what he said. He said, what could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. And that's from Deuteronomy 26. That's what they quoted. That's what was in their mind was God leading his people out of bondage into a new land so they could worship God freely. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity, etc. Let them therefore praise the Lord because he is good and his mercies endure forever. That's Psalm 107. Yea, let them which have been redeemed of, of the Lord show how he hath delivered them from the hand of the oppressor. When they wandered in the desert wilderness out of the way and found no city to dwell in, both hungry and thirsty, their soul was overwhelmed in them. Let him confess before the Lord his loving kindness and his wonderful works before the sons of men. You don't see people talking like that very much anymore. Much less our elected officials. Here's the first charter of the Plymouth Council. They land at Plymouth Rock. They establish that settlement. And they, they're going to charter a government because we're not anarchists as Christians. Men in this world, even if they are righteous men, still must be governed. Do you believe that? So they're going to do it God's way. And so here's what King James, again, King James of England said this, in hope thereby to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. What was in King James's heart in allowing these people and granting them lands in the new world, what was in his heart for them to do? Promote Jesus Christ everywhere they go. That's how we got this start in this nation. 
You can't take that out of us. That's who we are. So here's what happened. That Mayflower was headed for Virginia. But the winds blew, and who controls the winds? And if you say the government, I'm going to come down there and pop you. Okay? Who blew them up to Plymouth Rock? Okay, God did. Having been blown off course to Virginia, they landed at Cape Cod November 11, 1620. Little did they know that they had landed there a few years earlier, that had they landed there a few years earlier, they would have been massacred by the Pawtuxet, the Indian tribe. The tribe, however, had been completely destroyed by a plague in 1617. Had they come to that same place earlier, they would have been slaughtered. But God moved those people out of their way and then blew their ship up to Plymouth Rock, and that's where they landed. Okay? Uh, what did they do? When they finally found the New World, they're, they're at Plymouth Rock, they're still on the ship. They're still living on that boat. What did they do before they ever left the boat to be on the land? You see, as long as they're on the boat, who governs them? Huh? The captain of the boat. That's his rule. He rules over those people. That's his ship, and he's got a say in what goes on there. They're fixing to leave his authority and step on the land where that captain has no authority. They did not step over in the land and say, We're not, we don't need government. We serve God. That's not what they did. Mayflower Compact, before they ever left that ship, here's what they said they were going to do. In the name of God, amen. Who, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. See, they know why they're there. And honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, in other words, by, with, by, in the company of all the people present there, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Which means we know that the moment we row off this ship and stand on that dry ground, we have to have a form of government. Somebody has to make decisions. Somebody has to judge. Somebody has to be the governor of our colony. We can't just leave and just every man do that which is right in his own eyes. That was not in their heart. So, they're doing this, he says, for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. In other words, we have to have government so we can preach the gospel. And if, we don't ha if our government isn't right, then our cause is going to fail. And they knew it. Okay? So, um, and by virtue hereof, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. Let me tell you something. When you're God's people, you don't rebel against authority. And I always have to throw this in because people are going to write me emails. Except when that authority tries to get you to go against God's authority or something that God said, man must be governed. We're not anarchists. We don't just do whatever we want to because that doesn't fit with the gospel that we're trying to preach to people, does it? Raise your hand if God saved you out of some bad things. Okay? If we were conti to continue in those things while we're trying to preach the gospel to people, what does that say to lost people? Well, let's see. They're going to heaven, they say, but they drink and they run around, they do drugs, they do this and that and the other. So why should I even bother going to church? Because I'm doing the same thing as they are. It doesn't work. Man must be governed. He must follow certain rules and principles. So the first charter of Massachusetts in 1629, here's what it said. You know Massachusetts, right? It's a state. It has its own governor, its own legislature, its own judges. They have some, some of the rules and laws that they have in Massachusetts. They don't have in Missouri. Okay? In Missouri, we can walk around with our sidearm and go like this in public and 
carry our pistol around. Hey, what kind of gun you got there? Hey, you know, we can do that here. Massachusetts? No, nah, that's Ted Kennedy stuff. That's not so much us, okay? But before Massachusetts became liberal, what founded Massachusetts as a colony was this. And for as much as the good and prosperous success of the plantation of the said parts of New England, and for the directing, ruling, and disposing of all other matters and things, whereby our said people, inhabitants there, may be so religiously, peaceably, and civilly governed as their good life and orderly conversation may win and incite the natives of the country to the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith, which is our royal intention. And, it, and I'm going to say this to anybody with Native American First Nations background. The Great Spirit is not God. The Great Spirit that those of Native American heritage worship is not the same God as what's in your Bible. So they need to be saved just like the rest of us need to be saved. Amen? And that was, that was the intention. And the adventurous free profession is the principal end of this plantation. That was Massachusetts. Massachusetts was established so that these people could earn their living, grow their crops, and preach the gospel. That was what was in their heart. John Cotton, one of the early Puritan ministers, one of the most influential leaders in shaping the future of New England, he based, that is not the bell, he based his code of laws on the scripture. Isaiah 30, turn to Isaiah 33, 22. I'm going to show you our government in the Bible. Isaiah 33, 22. Okay? Look it up in your Bible and underline it. Read that verse. Isaiah 33, 22. Read it. What do you see there? Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. In that one verse, you have the three separations of powers that we now have in this country. The chief executive has powers that the Congress and the courts don't have. Congress has powers that the president and the Supreme Court doesn't have. The Supreme Court has powers that Congress and the President don't have. And I, I, I want it to stay that way. Because even as bad as it is now, we still have an ability to elect people that we feel is going to best represent our ideologies, which is from the Bible, and keep our nation strong and do it God's way. But to eliminate these three forms of government, out of this nation and go with a centralized authority it would be exactly what Israel did in the days of Samuel, give us a king. The idea of having three forms of government, separate but equal, in this nation did not come from Rome, it did not come from Egypt, it came from the Word of God. That's where they got it from. I'm going to read you one more thing, I'm going to let you go here. See, I like this kind of stuff. Okay? This is what John Cotton said. Let all the world learn to give mortal men no greater power than they are content they shall use. For use it they will. And unless they be better taught of God, they will use it ever and anon. He's talking about an abuse of power. For whatever transcendent power is given will certainly overrun those that give it. And those that receive it, there is a strain in man's heart that will sometime or other run out to excess unless the Lord restrain it, but it is not good to venture it. Now, let me break this down very quickly. I may just stop here. But here's what he's saying. Man left to himself with authority will abuse that authority. We have people right now in the state of Missouri, in Jefferson County, and in Washington, D.C., who are constantly trying to chip away at our Constitution. Why? Because they want more power over the people. How many of y'all believe that? It's the inherent wicked nature of mankind. That if those who are in authority are not bound by certain principles themselves, they will run amok over the people. And the strength of this nation is not 
the power of our government. It is the limitation of our government. That's what I believe in. Okay? That's what our forefathers, our Christian forefathers, believed about this nation. Was that earthly governments, civil governments, even church government should be limited. I do not have total power, total control over everything that goes on in the church and over everybody's salvation. I don't have that authority. I don't have the authority to tell you one thing while the Bible tells you something different. I do not have that authority. My authority in this church is limited by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad it's that way. That way, if I do something, and it's in accordance with the Word of God, and somebody in the church don't like it, and they say, well, Pastor, you did that. I just think that's wrong. I'll just say, look, I did it according to the Scripture. Take it up with God. It was His idea. Okay? Amen? Amen. I love this country. I still do. I'm not ready to yield it over yet. Okay? I've got children and grandchildren who are going to have children of their own that I want them to have the same freedom to choose Jesus or not. But I still want them to have that freedom to do it. I don't want a religious government over America forcing everybody into a common religion. I don't want that. That's wicked. But on the same, I don't want an overpowering government to, ex to exclude all religions away from my grandchildren so that they really don't have a choice to follow Christ. They'll get in trouble over it. I want the country that these men dreamed of as they came to this land. That's the one I want. Amen? Heavenly Father, I love you, and I love America. And God, you have this nation. God, I've been to other parts of the world. I've seen how people live. And Lord, I just, sometimes I think, I, I don't know if I could live this way. Because God, you've given us very comfortable things in this country. You've given us wealth. You've given us health. You've given us multitudes of people. We have inventions. We have everything going for us. But we're turning our back on you. And so, Father, maybe you might have to start taking some things away from America so that she'll turn back to you. And, Father, that's what I pray for. That's what I hope in. But, Father, Lord, if we, we know that if we lose this country... We have a far greater one awaiting us. Father, we look forward to it. We thank you for showing us some good things today. Bless your word. Stir up our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.